Chapter 1 The Child Without a Memory Carla Asperger looked beautiful sitting across from her husband, Greg, in her green dress. Her eyes were this bright blue. He was drinking a rather pricey wine, and she was drinking caffeine-free soda. But neither of them could afford much at the time with a baby on the way, and Greg, having just finished his master's in social work, they were truly in love, and there was nothing that could change that. As they were walking across the street to their car, both laughing hysterically about their waiter's mustache, the neon light flickered like a strobe. The world for both of them seemed perfect. As the key turned in the ignition, Greg pulled out into the street and started to go through the intersection. And as he turned onto Fifth Avenue and Fifth and Avenue Street, a man in a black button-up suit holding a small boy came into the view of the headlights. And he careened to the right to avoid the man and the boy he was holding. Greg watched in slow motion as Carla smashed into the side and the boy slid across the road, hitting with the man hitting the bumper. There was a flash of fluorescent blue light and everything went black except he could still see the fluorescent blue glow. The EMTs had to fight Greg to put the IVs in as he screamed to see his wife and unborn child. And then he suddenly remembered the other child and the strange man dressed in black. A deep, sickening feeling reached down into Greg's stomach. Had he killed someone, he could feel his head go dizzy and stare blank. He remembered the wine, and he knew that the police wouldn't look kindly on someone who was drunk, hitting a father and his child. Greg was strapped to the bed now, and waited as the sickening feeling continued to grow. Had he really killed someone? Was his wife an unborn child? All right. The questions ran over and over like a newsreel on CNN. When he was finally calm, a nurse and a social worker slipped in. I'm sorry, but your wife and baby died in the crash. Was all the social worker said to him. And then the social worker paused. We have a police officer here. He has some questions for you, if you don't mind. Greg couldn't believe he had killed his wife and baby, and he knew he was going to go to prison, but maybe he deserved it. He felt horrible. The police officer came in with a frown, and taking his hat off, sat down in the chair next to Greg. Hi, I'm sorry about your wife and kid, if you don't mind. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Greg nodded. You said there was a man in a black suit, is that right? Greg nodded, his throat too sore to talk. We weren't able to find any man in a black suit. It seems he doesn't exist. Also the boy. Greg wondered if he had imagined the man and the boy. The officer continued. We can't seem to place him. He has no ID. We can't even match a thumbprint. We've contacted missing persons, but they can't place him either. Another thing, he has no memory of the crash. In fact, he doesn't remember a family brother, sisters, or anything for that matter. We were wondering if you could tell us if you know anything about him. Because we are stumped. 
Greg shook his head. Chapter 2. Not a Battle Mage. Mr. Asperger, you couldn't get into a good college if you paid them. Your grades are atrocious. Not only are you last in your class, but you intentionally got a zero on all of your standardized testing scores, said a very frustrated guidance counselor to Nimbus. Nimbus tried to interrupt the rant. Mr. Montenegro, I didn't get those grades on purpose, and I have art club. But the guidance counselor was very adamant. Mr. Asperger, I can show you a video on YouTube of a dog that did better on her ACT than you. No human being could possibly be that dumb. Ergo, you must have done this on purpose, or just to aggravate me. I am setting you up for a redo of the exam, not because I think you deserve it, but rather because no one could possibly, possibly be that stupid. But if you don't do this stunt again, I can't help you. If you do this stunt again, I can't, can't help you. Nimbus was about to tell Mr. Montenegro that he had an A in art. But before he could get the words out, he was shooed from the disgruntled man's office. Walking down the hall to the cafeteria for lunch, Nimbus Asperger was smiling for some inexplicable reason. Maybe it was because he just didn't like Mr. Montenegro, or maybe it was just that the universe seemed right to him at that very moment. As he walked into the cafeteria, there was a big poster on the wall for the graduating class advertising prom. Nibis didn't feel any overall interest in going. He wasn't a very social person in any way, rather reserved and quiet. He would spend the whole day in the art room if he could. But with all of the retakes he was doing as far as classes, Nimbus was spending time after and before school to fit art into his high school curriculum. He was, for some reason, very talented in the beauty of avant-garde aesthetics. He particularly liked action painting. Lunch he would eat alone, but he liked to be alone in the depths of his thoughts. The only trouble he ended up in was Michael Weiss. Weiss would always intimidate him whenever he could, knocking his lunch tray over, goading him into fights that he nearly avoided. He was basically a little bitch. Nimbus couldn't stand the cocky bitch. He was nothing but a coward who felt that he could push Nimbus around and even though he didn't like meeting with a hostility, Nimbus knew enough not to strike back. It wasn't like he was prepared anyhow. He hadn't been in a fight since the third grade, and that was against Mary Parchin. She was a bitch. As Nimbus sat down, he could see Weiss approaching with several of his cronies. Nimbus just put his hand to his forehead and slid the palm and fingertips across his dark black hair with its natural streaks of gray. Hey, fuck up. I hear you failed the test. Who does that? At least my dad's paying for my college. What college is going to accept you? You don't even have a father. Nimbus could suddenly feel this deep sensation as his fist went up, landing square on the kid's nose, and he heard a crack. The sound was sickening, and there was blood everywhere. The lunch monitor came running, and as he felt the fire raging in his gut, Nimbus threw up into the void that was suddenly spinning around him. Somebody call 911. He could hear the screams as his head hit the floor and there was a neon blue flash of light 
as bright as the sun. Suddenly he was surrounded by the arms of a man in a black suit with a button-up collar. Things began to fade out. Nimbus could hear the man yelling, Cole, get the boy some new blood. This is one of the worst case castings I've seen. Do you think he's a battle mage? Everything was like a dream. Nimbus hear the man named Cole could hear the man named Cole reply. I don't see I don't sense battle magic. This is something else. The first man said with a quick draw of the breath, Well if he isn't a battle mage, I don't know what he is. Chapter three class. Nimbus woke up on a bed in what looked to be an old World War II infirmary. There were other young men and women laying in identical twin bunks, each with their own assortments of injuries. The guy next to him wasn't awake, and a girl to his left was on a ventilator. He saw people going in and out of the room with blue button-up suits on. They were all busy with one thing or another, reading charts that seemed anything but medical, covered in strange symbols and pictographs. One doctor, if they could be called doctors, was looking at a chart and then down at a boy who couldn't be older than 12, and everything was written in sign language. The boy's hands were covered in gauze and looked to be burnt pretty bad. Nimbus got to sit up feeling the pain in his ribs and suddenly lay back down as the screen went up in front of his face. On the screen was a woman dressed in a black button-up suit identical to the one the man wore who had caught Nimbus. Hello, you are probably wondering where the fuck you are, what the fuck you are doing here, and what just happened. If you need to panic, it's definitely not okay, and you should flag a man or woman in blue. So are you panicking? The screen popped up with a question thingy. Nimbus popped a bubble that said no. The lady replied, good, because when you entered Anastasia, we made sure that you would not have panic or paranoia by giving you a small pill. The pill is a magic one that was made by one of the healing magicians that are in the blue uniforms. Sometimes apprentices make pills that don't work. It's important that all of our apprentices know whether they made the correct dosage. You too may be a healing magician, but this may not be your only specialty. You see, we, were a we are a school of magicians, and you, Nimbus Asperger, are a magician. We find new magicians when they activate their powers, and this occurs rather violently. That is why you are in an infirmary. You are a novice. We teach novice who wear white, apprentice who wear the color of their specialty, and master who wear black. You will not be a master for a long time, but this is okay. Now if you feel like it, raise your hand and you will be assisted to the novice dormitory. Nimbus raised his right hand and a woman in blue walked over to him. She was smiling but nervous. Wincing, she tried to smile at him. You prepared my pill, didn't you, said Nimbus. The young woman gave a grin and made an excited expression with her fist and elbow to say victory. Then as Nimbus looked across the room he saw a young man pull a scalpel off of a pan and raise it to his attending. Motherfuckers, what did you do to me? Are you going to anal probe me? Where the fuck am I? The woman whose name tag read Patricia said with a smile, This way, calm as could be, 
Nimbus smiled at the wild man. Nimbus was given a white button-up suit and walked into a large dormitory whose walls were covered with pin-up murals, either female or male. Patricia smiled. The pill will wear off soon. You are in the adult dorms for novice operations. As Patricia left, Nimbus could feel the panic setting in. His heart was racing, and he looked down at his hand, which was wrapped in a bandage. His mind went back to the cafeteria and the blood and the broken face of the other kid. He could feel himself worrying about what if this and that. Then he looked around at the others who were in the dormitory. A man walked up to Nimbus. Hey, I'm Jake. You're a newbie. Nervous, don't worry. When routine sets in, things will begin to make sense again. Your schedule is on your bunk. Man, what did you do to your fist? Check out my scar. Jake held up his arm, which had a greenish birthmark on it. Walking over to a bunk that read Nimbus Asperger, Nimbus could see a schedule posted to the bottom of the bunk. Above his, there was a metal trunk next to it. He lay down in the bunk, looking up at the schedule. He watched as suddenly the first class lit up bright yellow. It read intro in blue lettering. The room then number next to it said 198.4. Jake swung down from the upper bunk. The second number is the hallway.